By God's grace, I am where I am today. By God's grace, someone's not here. Someone didn't get up. Someone didn't wake up. Someone didn't snap back. Someone didn't receive grace. Someone didn't forgive forgiveness. Didn't receive forgiveness. But God, I'm here. But the same grace that has brought you here, say it like King James, the same grace that has brought you here too far will take you further. God wants to journey with someone today. God wants to take someone further and higher. You need to make up in your mind that that's going to be you. I want to go. 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 So God, fix my mind. As the word comes, begin to work in my heart. Holy Spirit, third person in the triune God, be present in our worship and in our celebration. There are places where we are stuck, but you can unstick us. There are places where we're feeble, but you can strengthen us. There are places where we are narrow in our perception, but you can stretch us. There are places where we are weak, and you will build us up. There are ways where we are small and timid, and you want to make us bold, 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 bold. I hear the word bold today. God wants to make someone bold. God wants to make someone bold in their faith, in their celebration, and in their praise. If you think God is finished with you, you're so mistaken. If you think that you're only what the enemy says you are, he is so mistaken. Don't listen to that liar. But today you are who God says you are. The babies told you to that. You are who God says you are. You know what? You are forgiven. You are the elect of God. You are chosen. You are set apart. You are washed. You are redeemed. You have been justified. Sins atoned for. You have good status in God because of Christ Jesus. Now, I just want you to begin to praise. Not me, not the worship team, not the children, not those that have ushered you in, not those who make sure that you can hear and see well, but for the Jesus who has placed you right smack dab in the middle of the will of God, the Jesus through his own blood who has washed you and set you free. The Jesus who went to hell to, 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 to take the keys and authority over death and hell. The Jesus who lives, who is on the right hand of the Father, living to make intercession for you. The Jesus who died and was buried and raised again to offer new life to us. All of you who have, for, who have received forgiveness. All of you who are receiving forgiveness. All of you who want and need to receive forgiveness. Begin to put your hands together right now. Come on, come on, put your hands together right now. Come on, put your hands together right now. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, then as you do it, someone just let it out. I'm forgiven. I'm washed. I'm right. I'm justified. He has made us holy. 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 Come on, come on. Don't let your praise down. They're just singing. That's all they're doing. Come on, put your hands together and praise for this Lord. Come on. Come on, come on. Give it up for the Savior of the world. Worship him, worship him. I receive worship your him. Love for Come on. Me. Can we lift our hands to the Lord? Come on, say that, y'all. I receive your love for me. Yes, yes. I receive. Do you receive it? Because it's offered today. It's offered in this place. I receive your love for me. One more time. Can you just say this with us? I receive your love for me. so good, Jesus. You're so good, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, God. Oh, we worship you, God. Ah, we worship you because we receive your love. It evokes a response in our hearts, Jesus, and we worship you. Listen, before you take your seats, I know I was, I was listening. I know you all have already greeted each other. And sometimes we do that in such an obligatory manner. But I want you to understand, you bear the mark of Christ, which means you have the ability to pronounce a blessing on someone. Some of us are scarred because people, teachers, leaders, have said things that have shaped us and scarred us. The opposite of cursing is a blessing. So just take a minute and turn around to someone. And don't just like, kind of give them that little smile like you're scared they're going to say something to you. I want you to shake someone's hand. I just want you just to say, God's blessings rest on you. Come on, you got to unfold your arms to do it. There you go, there you go. Listen, when you get together with the people of God, don't forget to bestow a blessing on them. Don't forget, push that blessing down on them. Now listen, if y'all want to be still and be quiet, you better stay home. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Let's turn to John chapter 6, please. Ushers, can we, can we close those doors? With so much coming down against young people and so many people in trusted places hurting children, to have a safe place where parents can bring their children knowing that they're going to be loved and revered and respected. I think that's something beautiful. That stirs my heart. I want you to know that was my ministry today. You have to come in and say, okay, where did God speak to you? Where did God speak to me? You know, when, the, when those little kids standing up here, you know, they weren't even high enough to look at my water on here. And let me tell you something. They, don't, they, they may not have the theological acumen to grasp the truth of what they're saying, but they're going to say it until it makes sense to them. This is, this is the beauty of God's word. You don't have to understand it. When you chew broccoli, you don't know how it works so that your saliva breaks it down, then it goes where it needs to go. You don't understand how it goes. You just get the right stuff in your mouth. But your system knows how to draw it down to your heart, to your liver, to your blood system. Your body knows what to do. We have to keep putting truth in the mouths of these children. We have to keep putting truth in front of them because there's so many negative things that are coming at them. So I want you to, un I want you to understand something. When you walk into a ministry, folks who've known ministry for a while and they want to say, what are signs of life? It is not the, it's not the preacher. It is not the colors on the walls. It's not the seats. People, you need to look at children. Are they incorporated? Are they excited? Are they learning? Are they growing? And so when I say I really appreciate you all for what you're doing with our children, I'm also saying I thank you for what you're doing with our ministry because you're assuring that Fountain of Life will continue. So help me thank them again. And Ms. Brittany, I haven't put you on the spot. Can you stand for just a moment? We're really proud of you for finishing your bachelor's degree. We're very proud of you. <laughs> the Lord is faithful to us, and he is so worthy to be praised. He is good, and I consider it a blessing to be able to be called by him and to know him. Today we have an opportunity to worship in so many ways, in prayer, uh, a little bit later in our giving, in our singing, but we also get to worship God in, a, in the word. And we get to listen to his heart and his message to us. And I love God's word because it's his power to save us. It's his power to save us. So this year, I'll be talking about this a little bit more um, in, a few, in a few coming weeks. Um, I'll be doing a series in February that will just will shape where we're going for this year. But just know that it's going to, it's going to require you and um, your Bibles becoming more acquainted, better acquainted. And um, we, need to be, we need to be people of the book. And we need to not just be able to, to, to quote it or say, yeah, my grandma used to say it somewhere in there something like. And this is, this is not an indictment. We're going to teach you how to read it. We're going to teach you how to understand it. We're going to encourage you. But God has just given me such a download that there are things that I'm trying to work out in preaching and things that we're trying to work out in counseling and there's things we're trying to work out on that sofa in my office. And God is saying, just let me add them. If you, if they, 
if my word gets in people and if it abides in them, I'm going to begin to uproot some things that people have been trying to get rid of. I'm going to change some things that people have been trying to change. I'm going to bring truth, that sword that cuts and back and forth. I'm going to bring the truth and the power of it. I'll tell you something. You can, have, you, you can have children in your church, but if you don't have Bibles and if you don't have the word and if it's not alive and if it's not being read, we are not going to really receive what God wants us to do. So, so I want you to begin just to do what you got to do. Shake those ugly thoughts. I, I, I felt a little from folks like, oh, yeah, the Bible. And it's not because you don't want to read. It's because you've been frightened because you think, I don't understand it. We're going to encourage you. There's no shame to my game. You all who've been around know me. I'm a grown man. I'm 51 years old. I got a doctor degree, and I have a children's Bible. I a, so if I, don't, if I don't fully get it, I go to the children's Bible. And I would look at it and hear from a different perspective. I want to get what God has for me. I want to get. When you see people doing things that you want to do, you want to learn the secrets. You want to know what's pushed you, what's encouraged you. I've had great mentors. I've had great teachers. I've had people that have taught me to pray and taught me to stand. But the thing that has kept my faith alive by walking with God for, what year is this? Seven, this is 2015? I converted 40 years ago this year. So as an 11-year-old, 40 years ago, Labor Day, 1975, what's kept my faith sharp is the presence of God's word in my heart. It is not a rule book for me. It is not where I go when I'm feeling down so I can read the scripture so it can be my lucky charm so I can look through the scripture to see if God's going to give me some numbers. But in scriptures, I see the plan of God revealed in a way that I, as an 11-year-old kid, could understand it, and it brought Christ close to me. I sense a restlessness in the souls of people because we have the form of godliness, but we deny the power. And you will never know the power of God without the presence of the word of God. You will never have it. You'll never have it. And so what we'll do is we'll overindulge in other stuff to make up for this. But this year, God is, is, is raising not the standard, but the understanding. He wants to give us a greater revelation of who he is through his son, Jesus, which is revealed in Scripture. He wants to give us an idea of his plan and his heart for us. And that will keep you. That will help you to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. We have a great sense of what that is. You will see the mission of God, and you will see your role in the mission of God. And when you understand your role in the mission of God, it gives you a sense of purpose and identity. When you have purpose and identity, you have the authority to say no to stuff that cuts off your authority and the strength to say yes to stuff that brings you closer to it. So again, if there's anything in my life or anything in my 40-year journey with Christ that you choose to emulate, don't look at who I am today and what I do today. Let me tell you a choice I made 40 years ago that made me the man I am today. To be a boy of the book who's becoming a man of the book, standing in God's word and understanding his plan for me. Understanding what he is saying to me. And let me tell you something. You may not think this. The enemy is not afraid. There's a few things he's afraid of. But he's not afraid of beautiful churches. He's not afraid of messages that make us feel good about ourselves. But he is deathly afraid of folks who know who they are in God. Because when the devil gets busy, we don't shrink back. We use Twitter language on the devil. SMH, SMH, devil. It's not about to go down. Shaking my head, that's not cuss words. Come on, follow the church, follow us. Come on up to the 21st century. Two weeks ago, we talked about launching in Jesus' story with Peter when he called him from the shores. Last Sunday, we talked about shifting because once you've launched and a thing is experiencing, a flying object is experiencing, it's on its trajectory, you really don't want to bring it back down to the launching pad, but you want to make a change of course, and that's called shifting. So we said that once we've launched, we then need to shift. Today, I want to talk about, and, and, and not directly, but indirectly, I want to talk about soaring. 
Because once you've launched and then Christ has made a shift in what you're doing, you then have the authority to soar. Let me tell you, there is something that God wants to give you that the enemy does not want you to have. He wants you to have the sense of what it means to have been launched by God and then shifted by the teaching of his word and the Holy Spirit so that you understand what it means to soar in unity with God. Listen, when you're not doing that, when you have not launched and you have not shifted, you're flying, but you're flying on good looks. You're flying on good talent. You're flying on your grandmama's Bible. You're flying on some feeling you've got. You're flying on a whole lot of things that are not really rooted necessarily in truth. But when God has launched you and then you are in tune to the Holy Spirit's teaching through prayer, through community, through the word of God, and a shift can take place in you, and then you know that you are on the trajectory that God has set, it gives you authority to move in ways that you have not been able to move in before. Now, many of us know volume, we know loudness, um, we, 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 we know tactics, but when you have authority, you don't have to boast, you just do. When you know that you are in sync with what God wants, then we move to a place of soaring. I want you to know something. I want to soar. And let me tell you something. After 40 years, I've gotten some height and I've got some wind under my wings, but I want to go higher, Lena. I want to, I want to, I want to go higher. I don't want to just hover around 10,000 feet where they tell you can turn your devices on. I want to go, I want to go higher. And I want you to come with me. Because in doing so, your heart becomes more in tune with God. You become more assured of what he wants you to do. And you live out, not just find out, you live out your purpose. If we spend all of our lives trying to find our purpose, when do we then live it out? We put so much focus in finding ourselves. Listen, I was found at the cross. Christ found me. I don't want to be like one of them crazy dogs chasing this stuff. I don't want, this is what you do. Oh, I got to go back because I just got dizzy. And I used to be able to do that. Thank you, Lord. Now, as I was saying, I want to understand that I've been found so that I can soar. Now, this is something that God's been dealing with me about. But I believe he's, he's saying this for us as a, as a body. Because as he begins to speak to me and challenge me, I want to share it with the people that I'm charged with shepherding. I feel that the shift that God is working in my heart and my, and my priorities, because, um, because every height, every level has new challenges. So don't get freaked out. Some people want to go higher because you think when you go higher, you have no more problems. You just have new problems. You have more expensive problems. So you just think, if I just move from here, then you move over there, and guess what? Your, your faucet's going to still leak. leak. It's, just a, it's just a cost, more costly faucet. You move over there, you guess what? The snow is going to still fall on your sidewalk, except over there, your neighbors put a little note in your mailbox that said, we would really appreciate it. The neighborhood association would really appreciate it. The neighborhood association is going to call the police, and you're going to get cited if you don't shovel your driveway. So don't think that you want to go higher so you can miss issues. That when you go higher, there's new challenges, but that's okay because you have gone higher. One of the things that keeps the church from really going higher is the fact that we think that we are supposed to go higher for ourselves. And when I understand that the, that the height that I'm, that I'm reaching for is really God's plan for me, it's really what God wants to carry out in the world, when I realize that, then I'm not afraid to ask God for help and for strength and for direction, because it's God's height that he wants. And there's something he's trying to do with me and in spite of me at that place. And so some of us are afraid of heights because we think, I don't know if I'm worthy of it. I don't know if I've earned it. First of all, it's not your height. When I talk about sore, I'm not talking about because you deserve it. You're good. You got great wings. You got good wingspan. You got a good, you know, draft. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying sore because God wants to be seen in this world. With the craziness that we're seeing, the craziness that we are seeing. When I, when I, um, I, read, my, I read the news on my smartphone, um, when I get up in the morning and read the news, I have to check to see if I'm reading The Onion. Because there's so many shootings and, and, and crazy death that I actually, I, I read to see, is this a joke? I'm like, no, this is Huffington Post. Okay, this is legit. Kind of. Don't you think that when all of this is going on, God wants to reveal God 
Don't you believe that God, in the midst of such turmoil, God wants to sp- turn a spotlight on people who really do love each other across racial lines and class lines? In this world with so much poverty, don't you think God wants to show up and have people who hardly have anything supporting people who need something? Don't you think God wants to show up and, and let people know that the word and the truth of God is not dead, that God is not going to sleep? And so we are part of what God wants to do in this world. And so as we soar, it is God's heights, it is God's plan, it is God's desire. And I want us to journey with God. So today I'm going to preach a little bit from, uh, teach um, rather from John chapter 6. And I'm talking about an interaction that Jesus has with his disciples, with um, a large crowd that's following him and some, some, some folks who are upset. Minister Carlotta read my passage, there's a lot of them, John 6, 25 through 35, and then verses 60 through 68. Um, write them down if you can, uh, text them to yourself so that you can read it again, because um, I'm going to hit some points kind of quickly, but you want to read through it. You can also listen to this again, because each week, um, Karen and her team upload the audio of the sermons, and so if you follow Fountain of Life on Facebook... Uh, we tweet the link, or we also put the link on, so that you can also listen to it. And my notes will be uploaded. Uh, that's something we try to do every Sunday. The, the audio is uploaded every, every Sunday because I want you to get truth into you because truth, truth changes you. I thank God because that's adding years to my ministry because I don't have to manipulate you. I don't have to browbeat you. I don't have to guilt trip you. I don't have to yell at you. I can just take you to the word and let the Holy Spirit work in all of us what this truth is. In the essence of this, Jesus is calling the disciples and the broader group who are at the, at the time are also disciples to understand that we've got to ingest him. In fact, what he says, you got to eat my, my, my flesh and you got to drink my blood to be a part of me. And when he did that, these people got mad. They got upset. So um, I want to entitle today's message, An Unhappy Meal. And I want to show you where people got turned off by Jesus, not so that we can look at people 2,000 years ago and shake our heads, but so that we can look at ourselves and see perhaps where we have missed the Lord also. In verse 25, we find ourselves really in the middle of the story. Jesus, as we see in John 6 and 1, he crosses to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, it's also referred to in John's book as the Sea of Tiberias. I think John's the only one who referred to it as the Tiberian Sea, Sea of Tiberias, but it's, but it's the sea, sea of Galilee. And people are coming to see Jesus because of the miracles. They love what Jesus is doing, and they see the miracles. And it's interesting. John says that Jesus came, and he saw that they were following him because of the miracle, and he went and sat down on the side of a hill. I want to say this to leaders, choir directors, campus workers, um, division directors, managers. Just because there's a crowd does not mean you're supposed to do something. Now, we're taught if there's an issue, you're supposed to fix it. Jesus came. They were following because of the issue. And Jesus went and sat down. Now, it's interesting. As Jesus sat down, he already was reading their hearts. So understand this. Understand this. Jesus already knows what we're up to. Even when we're not quite sure, he already knows what he's up to. John then says, as he's sitting there talking to his disciples, because Jesus believed in resting. In resting. Um, I've got an older friend who teases me. Um, like when he hears that I'm taking a vacation or I'm taking a week off um, to, to, to go do something with the family. He's old school. Old school said a pastor had two wives, his wife and his church. That's not in the scripture. And I can't afford two wives. <laughs> that's the first time y'all heard her voice all year. Yeah, that's right, baby. Preach that. But I love seeing that when Jesus came and it was tired, he sat down. Because sometimes you think you got to do stuff. And sometimes you get to the place you have to say, if this is really God's ministry, he got to do something. He's got to do something. And it's not because I'm disrespectful. It's not because I'm uncaring. It's because I believe that there's something that God can give you directly that I can't. That's why we're talking about committing people to the Word so we can grow, we can, we, can, we can get stronger in this. And so he sees them and he thinks it's almost Passover time. 
So Jesus begins to connect the dots, I believe, to set up a moment for some real beautiful interaction with the folks. So he's sitting there, and then he calls Philip over to him. He says, it's almost Passover time. Hey, Phil, how much food do we have in the cooler? Because there are a lot of people here. Now, later we find out in this chapter, it's 5,000 people. I don't think anybody's got a cooler. You need one of them Swanson trucks and stuff to have that kind of meat. I mean, you need the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. I mean, that's a lot of people. And so Philip says, come on, JC. It would take, it would take a year's salary to even get these people some hors d'oeuvres. They probably sit on the side of the hill laughing about this. You know we ain't got no money. You know Judas ain't going to get up off enough money to feed these people. Jesus already having a plan, Scripture says, already having a plan for what he's doing. He's like, hmm, what we working with? Peter says we got a boy here, and he has got five loaves and two fish. Wes could eat that by himself. And you know that brother right there can. Knocking kids over, taking their little lunch boxes. I'm sure that there were times, I'm sure there are times, and when we get to heaven, because I'm going to be in really good with the disciples, when I get to heaven, I'm going to get someone to the side and say, okay, was there any point at which you just thought Jesus just, just snapped? Because everything can be written down. You got to imagine, they something with 5,000 people, 5,000 people. And Jesus is going to say, um, how many napkins we got? And then he's got something in mind. He goes even further. Like he's really serious about it. What we got in bags around here? What can we, what can we pony up? Somebody must have thought he was going to do something. Hey, we got some five loaves and we got two fish. I bet they will drop it to see what he's going to do. And Jesus takes it. We don't know exactly how he does it, exactly what happens. But he starts, I don't know, just doing something with it. You know, Rubbing hot sauce on it, it, putting butter on the bread, warm. They're probably looking, what are you doing? What are you doing? Next thing they know, fish just jumping out, you know, the, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they start distributing it. You know the miracle. You know the miracle. You know the miracle. But you have to understand the whole story, people. That's why we have to become people of the book. Because we read that and we say, oh, Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread. Oh. But that's not what he's really trying to convey here. Now, he does want you to know he can do that. That's just sort of a freebie. He's just like, that's just for you to have. So he does it, and they eat. And listen, these folks eat until they're full. 5,000 folks. So then Jesus gets the bread. He said, make them sit down. They're like, all right, this man, going, okay, he's just going to play it all the way out. You tell 5,000 men to sit down. They think they're about to eat. Do you really want to tell 5,000 men, we fixing to eat, and you don't have anything up there but a couple of loaves and a couple of fish? Maybe you are going to die. They sit down, the miracle happens. It says when they were full, when they'd eaten enough, they were full. Jesus, because he likes to not have a waste, asked for a doggy bag. They got 12 baskets full of fragments of stuff that people hadn't finished eating. Here's something that this story hinges upon. And let me see if I can find this verse um, for you. Well, this actually happens before verse 25, so it's in there, trust me. This is why I want you to read, read the whole chapter, not just starting at 25. Read the whole chapter, not now, when you get home. He then does the miracle, and they receive it. They decide to crown him. Make note of this. When you read the passage, make note of this. This is one of the key things that I think this passage is saying to us today. When Jesus does something we like, we go get the crown. First of all, it's not your job to crown Jesus. If you think that you can go get a dusty, what are they going to get a crown from? This, this is fisher people on the, on the Sea of Galilee. They probably got some twigs and stuff. The little paper things from Burger King that you get on your birthday. They're going to get a little makeshift, make-believe crown, and they're going to crown him and make him their king because they watched what he did. Don't forget, they followed him because of the miracles. Then they saw another miracle. Now they're ready to make him the king. Now, let's get through this story. Jesus slipped away from them. He slipped away from them because they wanted to worship him when they thought they could manipulate him. 
When they thought that he was a dispenser who they could pull a lever and get bread, pull a lever and get a miracle, pull a level, lever and see some cool stuff, they went and they reached for the crown. Isn't it interesting that we love to crown Jesus when he works things out for our liking? Not good. We're going to get to good in a minute. Our liking. When work, job, life, home, health is going well, we love Jesus. And we want to crown him. And let me tell you something. We have commercialized Jesus because we peddle him as someone who can make your acne better. He can make your hair grow. He can make your husband strong. He can make your wife curvaceous. He can make your children obedient. He can make your school strong and, 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 and solid. And, we're, and people are chasing after Jesus who's going to do them good. This is the Jesus largely we worship in our churches. Because suffering and those things are things of the past. So Jesus crept away from the crowd. Thinking, no, I don't want to be that king because they don't really know who I am. So he goes and he sits down with the disciples and he tells them, why don't you head over across the sea to Capernaum? Why don't you go and do that? John says they get in the boat and they start rowing for three and a half miles. That's far. Jesus then gets out and walks on the water to them and gets in the boat. This is not the passage. John doesn't talk about when Peter gets out of the boat. But what is really funny, that these are fishermen, and they're on the boat, and they see Jesus in the water, and they start getting scared. I love what John says. Jesus said, it is I. Don't be afraid. He said, because it was when Jesus convinced them who he was, they let him in the boat. So I think they were saying, uh, no, partner. No, no, player. You know, I think Jesus trying to, I think, you know, he's been walking three miles. I think Jesus walked, you know. He was like, hey, how y'all doing? They said, uh-uh, until he proved who he was. They're like, oh, no, uh-uh. You ain't get up in this boat. What's, what's the password? How many fingers am I holding behind my back? What did your mom and daddy register when she was nine months pregnant? Name the three wise men. Name this tune. Okay, I think it's him. So once they prove it, he gets in the boat. They get to the side. The people wake up the next morning because, again, they want to see a sign. I have to keep reiterating that. They get, they get up in the morning, they don't see Jesus' disciples, and then they don't see Jesus. But they knew the disciples got in the boat, and Jesus wasn't in it, so they started looking for Jesus. When he didn't show up, they got in their boats and came across the sea because these people wanted to worship, or did they? Isn't it interesting that worship looks like worship until it's revealed that it isn't? They followed Jesus, but they weren't really seeking Jesus. Are y'all listening to me? There's an aspect of my walk that's following Jesus, following after Jesus, but not really seeking him. I want to get to the place where I can fully hear what it is he's saying and what he's doing to me. And they start searching for him, and this is very ironic. They get out of the boat, they find Jesus, and say, Rabbi, how'd you get here? We were looking for you. Where you at? And Jesus busted them out for their greed, and I think this is the core of the message. Jesus tells them in verse 27 of John 6. Verse 26, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. I still see crumbs in your beard. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to work the works? What must we do to work what God requires? And Jesus said, the work of God is this. This is still the work of God, folks. Folks who are hungry and serious about serving God, I want you to take note. Verse 29, this is the work to believe in the one he has sent. To believe in the one he has sent. Now, they saw miracles that led them to the hillside. They saw the miracle of the bread being multiplied. They know he probably walked across that water. They saw that miracle. And he said, the work of God is to believe in God. Just because you see a miracle doesn't mean you believe. Because it doesn't mean that you have engaged your heart to truly, to truly follow God. So he's challenging him. You know, he's challenging them here. And he says, then he asks him, what must we do? And he tells them, Believe in the one God has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign will you then give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Because our forefathers ate man in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then they start quoting scripture to Jesus. 
They wanted to manipulate Jesus so bad because they tried to crown him and he left. So now they still got the crown in their hands. They still got crumbs in their beard. And they're looking for Jesus because they want some more food. And if we crown him and give him a place to live in the palace, we know where he is and we want some more food. The church, the family of God that only wants a savior that they can put someplace nice and say, sit here, Jesus, and don't move. And I want you to stay right there until I need some more money, until I need some more friends, until I need some more car, until I need some more promises, until I need some more blessings. I want you to just sit right there, Jesus. And in this part, Jesus is not only talking to them, but he's talking to the people who think we are following Jesus. We worship him with a crown when we feel excited about what he's doing. But when he slips away from us and he eludes us and he comes back with a challenge, we're thrown for a loop. This is what I think God is presenting to the church of Jesus Christ in this country. But I think he's saying this specifically to Fountain of Life and probably other churches in different ways. I bet you without talking to each other, pastors in this city are preaching something very similar. If our hearts are not in the word and if we're not standing in prayer, chances are the Jesus who we start pursuing because we want it to be him to be our Lord, we start finding ways to crown him to be our sugar daddy. That is very, very subtle. And I see it. I've sat in my office. I've counseled people for 30 years. I've done nothing wrong. This is what God does for me. I've given God the best years of my life, and this is what has happened. I've trusted God for my youth, and look what happens to my marriage. I give my tithes, and look what's happened to my finances. And I listen to people as they begin to unravel, and they begin to think, this is not what I signed up for. And listen, until your world starts coming apart, you might not even know what it is that I'm talking about. But they were chasing Jesus because of what they wanted from him. Jesus goes on and said, don't work for bread, work for God. Do his works. Well, what do we have to do? He says, believe in the one that's sent. This is why we got to become people of the word. This is why we got to get back to the word. Because some of us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some of us are standing on hearsay. Some of us, others are standing on testimony because someone who on good faith told you what God can do. But it is not rooted in truth that comes from a revelation of God. You see, in order to stand, we've got to be in God's presence until the lights come on and God gives us an aha or an epiphany or a revelation of who he is. Because folks whose minds have not been revealed, have not had the truth revealed to them, they're very stagnant. And a lot of us are very religious, but we don't have a whole lot of revelation. We have a whole lot of scripture, but not a whole lot of revelation. We have a whole lot of journaling, but not a whole lot of revelation. Because you got to stand still to get a revelation. you got to shut your mouth to get a revelation. you got to stop begging God to hear what God is saying to you in order to get a revelation. You've got to be hungry to get a revelation. You've got to be here. I've got to have this desire for God to begin to help you to understand where you are and how far you are from God to get a real revelation and an understanding. Let me tell you something. There's nothing more frightening than a believer who thinks that they're standing in revelation and they're standing in the midst of hearsay. Hearsay has no value. It has no authority. You can't wield it and make the devil step back. The devil does not shrink at hearsay. He does not just shrink when you're saying, well, I know and have under good authority. But when you've been in the word of God and God has revealed truth inside your heart and the word of God has become true inside your soul, the enemy knows when that's no longer you talking, that is God talking through you. He understands it. He knows what hearsay sounds like because he does it. He knows what lies sound like because he is the father of every lie told. But when you've gotten a revelation, when you have not chased God because of what God has done for you, but you chase God because God has chased you, and you get in God's word, and you get a revelation, and you begin to talk to your circumstances, and you begin to talk to your children and your family, you begin to conduct your lives as if you've had a revelation from God, the enemy knows that you have been touched and changed. These folks were thronging Jesus. They were chasing Jesus across the water. They were chasing Jesus up the hill. They were running for Jesus, but their hearts weren't right. He would have stayed up all night long if their hearts were ready. When one woman at a well in the middle of the day, her heart was hot, her heart was soft. He walked all the way to her in the middle of the day in that hot Palestinian sun, and he talked to her. But these folks coming to Jesus in the cool of the morning, in the cool of the evening, he knew their hearts weren't right. Let me tell you something. This is why today at the end of this message, I want us to search our hearts. Because you know what? You're right. Nobody can judge you but God. You are absolutely right. But the flip side of that is nobody's going to judge you but God. 
So that means you may fool me, you may fool other people, you might excite other people, but God knows if you're chasing him or you're chasing his stuff. God really knows if you're really in this thing for the long haul. God really understands how sincere we really are. So that's when we come together with God. We ask him to purge our hearts. This is not meant to be a word of, this is not meant to be a place of fear. Oh, I don't know if where I am or not. That's why we gather ourselves. I don't know where I stand. That's why we gather ourselves. I'm not really sure. That's why we gather ourselves. Because if you listen to us and the message, you don't have to have any question any longer. If he has not given you a revelation, let us help you get one. If he's given you a revelation, let's help you get to it. But God is revealing himself. He is revealing his plan. He is revealing his heart. He is revealing his strength and his arm. And he wants his people to line up and sign up with him. And while the people are thronging him and pushing him because he, they think they want what he's got, he's got something that they don't really want. And so Jesus understanding that they're really not that sincere, they're going to then throw scripture up to the word of God. So they chased him on the hill because they saw the miracles. They sat there, ate his food, but they're too busy getting full that they don't see the miracle. Have you ever eaten God's blessing and not realized the miracle? You can lose the forest for the trees. Or is it the trees for the... You lose it. Listen, I'm going to need you to be your own historian. I'm going to need you to look back over your life to see where God has been miraculous. And I'm going to need you to ponder that thing and process that thing and let God marinate that thing in your soul until it becomes something that he has revealed inside of you. Because that thing is meant to propel you someplace. And if you don't have those in your life, that's okay. That is fine. That's why we have scripture. I want you to get in the scripture until you see the images of Christ who is, re who is representing God. Until you understand that God is God and will do what God says that God will do. But you've got to stop running past miracles and you've got to be able to let it, let it marinate inside you. These folks chased him because of the miracles, sat on the hill because of the miracles, ate bread, ate the miracles, got fed and chased him to make him their king. Not because they saw the miracle. Jesus said this, but because you were filled. He said, you didn't even get the revelation. When, um, when, when we got the miracle that I keep referring to a miracle of, uh, of my daughter's health when she was so little and we thought she was going, that she wasn't going to survive. I remember the Lord speaking to us in the hospital. Gave us a verse, Isaiah 43, I believe it is. 43, 4, I think it's 43. We said, I'm doing a new thing. But one of the words God gave me is there's going to come a time where your heart's going to be heavy. There's going to come a time where you're going to forget who I am. And when this girl gets bigger, you're going to sit her on your lap. And you're going to look in her face. And you're going to remember that the doctor said she's not going to live. She's going to have neurological disorders. She's going to have this. She's going to have that. You're going to sit her on your lap. You're going to look into her face. You're going to remember what I told you. You're going to put her back in her bed. And you're going to get up and move. Because I don't give you a miracle just so you can shout. I don't give you a miracle just so you can dance. I don't give you miracles for goosebumps. I give you miracles so that I can give you fuel to walk this thing out. And let me tell you something. Just like God said it. She got healthy. She lived. When she came up in the hospital, TV, radio, and ra TV, radio, and the newspapers were there. They told the story. Baby, prayer serves one pound, saves one pound. Baby, they did all the stuff. All, and we're just riding on the miracle, riding on the miracle. But one year go by, two years go by, she's doing better. She's not on the afternoon machine anymore. She's doing better. But then the next time, then it comes the time to go higher in God. And then now I'm beginning to become frightened because now I got to trust God for this new stuff. And he wants me to do this thing called Nehemiah. And he wants us to move into this new area. And I start becoming afraid. And I say, God, I don't know if I can. That starts sounding like the, the, the coward line. I start sitting there and twisting my little tail and saying, I do believe in spooks. I do believe in spooks. I do, I do, I do, I do. What am I doing out here trying to do all this stuff? Why not just go home and just be a safe little preacher? Why not just keep my job down on campus? Why do I have to follow God? Why do I have to get out of the, out of the comfort zone? Why, why, why? But you know what I did? I went home and did what God told me. I went home and said, baby, wake up. Little girl trying to sleep. Hey, Lexi, wake up. <laughs> she didn't even know what was going to say. Hey, come here. Sat on my lap. I looked in her face like God told me to. And I thought about all the things that I read in her medical report and all the things that the doctors told me. And I sat here and I watched how healthy she was. And not just how healthy she was, 
but God told me that she would be a sign that when I got to a place, he would remind me of his goodness. God has given you breadcrumbs, but we don't follow them. God has given you promises, but you don't follow them. And you sitting up worrying about stuff that he confirmed three years ago. You sit up scared about stuff that he gave you the evidence five years ago. You sit up scared of stuff, and five years ago, when God was healing someone or touching someone or renewing someone, he said, now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Then what happens is you think that it's your strength, that it's your ability, and you're standing there, and you're afraid to step into new territory because you don't know if you can do it. Because you have forgot that the miracles of God came to teach you that God was a miracle worker. And because you just saw that as well, maybe it was the medicine, maybe it was the doctors, maybe it was the surfactant, maybe it was the incubator, maybe it was the therapy, maybe they were wrong, and then the enemy talks you outside of your miracle. But if you're going to be a revelation woman and a revelation man, you got to remember what God has said to you. When all hell was shaking loose, it looked like heaven was too. And it seemed like nothing was going to work for you. What did God tell you in a sober moment? These folks forgot everything God did and everything Jesus told them. So that even when they're standing here with Jesus and they caught him, they caught Jesus. And they're out of breath because they've been swimming and rowing. And it said, hey, 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 we're hungry. He said, y'all you're not hungry for me. You're hungry for what I can give you. Do the work of God. They said, well, how do we do the work of God? They said, believe that I am who I said I am. They said, give me a sign. How many of you are not getting a sign because you didn't get the sign that he gave you already? Listen, your own grandfather told you, listen here, boy, I don't chew my cabbage twice. Now that's old school. Anybody remember that? Mr. God, you remember that? What that means? I'm not finna um, repeat myself. Oh, here's another one. This is one your grandmama said. Maybe your mama. Did I stutter? <laughs> this is one my grandmama liked. Let me say it one more time. Let me say it again. Make me say this again. So even naturally, we don't like repeating stuff that you know you say clearly. So Jesus states, I am the one you got to believe in. And they say, show us a sign. That's their response. How many of us in worship are asking God for a sign today? And you haven't run from the last sign. Because really, if you got out there and ran based on a revelation you got from the last sign, you couldn't fix your mouth to ask for a new sign. Let me tell you something. You need to get such a revelation from God. I'm about to go old school in saying this. That, Lord, if you don't do nothing else, I know that you are and I know that you can. Now, see, now, if you, live, if you have to live from revelation to revelation, you don't know of what I speak. But as we become people of the word and God gives you such a revelation, you can run out the miracle he's already given you. Listen. God has revealed himself to me so much that for him to give me another miracle, he got to catch me first. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all just looking at me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You okay? It's too warm in here. Y'all all right? Talk to me. We're going to turn the air conditioner on. You've got to get such a revelation from God that even if he says, you got to ride that one out until I come, then you need to ride it out. Tell it, write it, sing it, preach it, tweet it. You got to tell it. Listen, sometimes when I tell the testimony about, about what God has done, the testimony about my daughter, about our faith, sometimes the enemy says, no, don't tell. Don't say that. Some people know a oh, pound, eight ounces, December 2nd, do March 16th. But you know what? He might be right. You might be thinking that. But he wrong. I don't care. <laughs> Because I'm running because of it, because that's my miracle. That's where God showed up. That's where God spoke to me. That's where I got a revelation. That's what gets me up in the morning. That helps to introduce to me who he is, that he is a God who is who he says he is. When he says, I am that I am. He's, that's what, he, what he's saying is, Moses, I'm not about to define myself for Pharaoh. I am that I am. Which means, listen, you just tell Pharaoh God, say, I'm not about to try to squeeze myself into Pharaoh's little mind. Let's blow his mind. Tell him that the name of your God is one God. He got one name and not a million. He's got one name and one of them ain't Pharaoh. 
the fact that you're going to tell Pharaoh that God said is going to make Pharaoh mad. Because Pharaoh going to say, ain't I God? He's going to say, Mo, ain't I God? So when you come up and say, God said, Pharaoh's already mad. And then when you're like it's one God and not the millions of gods that Pharaoh honors, you're going to make him mad again. What revelation are you running on? Not what feeling. What revelation are you running on? It might have been a camp meeting when you were a kid at a Bible camp and you prayed something. It might have been in Sunday school and someone said, I think that you're going to be someone in law enforcement. I think you're going to be a singer. I think you're going to do great things. Where did God give you a revelation? Where did the light bulb come on? Where did God put something inside of you that let you know God is real? Because if you don't chase God, you're just going to chase God's stuff and God is not fixing to be pimped by the church. It's not. We think we're doing it. We think we do it. They're my brothers and my sisters, but they're wrong. And listen, let me tell you something. If this is your church and if I'm your pastor, don't you let me hear about you order no oil online, order some blessed cloth online. Don't you let me hear about you putting your, fan, your hand on the TV and praying. Don't you let me hear Because when you catch something, don't you bring it to my office and ask me to cast it out. Because I'm trying to help you from casting it in. I'm telling you. Years ago, our young people went to a seance called a prayer meeting and brought some little, I ain't going to tell you what it is, but all this, some of y'all were around, where are you, are you? <laughs> brought them people up to this church and they were scared and it's so crazy to show it up and they had little trinkets and stuff like that and they said, Pastor, I got something in my car, ran to his car, came back and pulled it out and said, said I got this from that meeting and I'm scared. I said, I'm good, I'm glad you're scared because I told you not to go up into that place. Now, you and your little trinket go home. You and your little corn go home. You and Beelzebub go home. Then we cast it out. I'm going to tell you, I ain't mean. I'm harsh, but I'm not mean. We dealt with it. We're going we to make it do what it do. We dealt with it. But I'm saying don't go chasing this stuff when you got Jesus. Don't go chasing me when you got Jesus. Don't go chasing television when you got Jesus. Don't go chasing foolishness when you got Jesus. And when you got a word that points you to Jesus, you don't need all that craziness. And they were standing right there with the creator of the universe saying, give me a sign. And they were standing on land that was signed, drinking water that he made that was signed, breathing air that he created that was signed, standing under a sun he created that was signed, living on a planet Earth that he made and put into order that was a sign and stood in the midst of the creator of the world and said, tell me something that shows me you are who you say you are. Speed the thing up, and Jesus said, in essence, they're going back and forth. They're going back and forth and talking and everything. They're going to quote scripture on Jesus. Scripture says that he fed them out in the wilderness. I like what Jesus said, like, mm-hmm, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I know. I'm the one that measured out the manna. I'm the one that made it stank when they tried to store it. I'm the one that made it extra crispy because everybody else didn't think that, and I wanted to have a little taste. They've been down in Africa for a while, so I know they like bread. And, and so, um, Becca got that as me. <laughs> but Jesus said, okay, I got you, I got you, but guess what? First of all, Moses didn't give them bread. They said, Moses gave us bread in the wilderness. Jesus said, well, first of all, first of all, Moses didn't give you bread. God, Father, Son, and Spirit gave y'all bread. So you tell me to give you a sign. Moses gave you bread. Uh-uh. Moses didn't give you bread. Moses was somewhere in the corner saying, let me die. Let me die. These fools out here. He did. Read your Bible. Moses says, kill him. Kill him dead. <laughs> All my life, I got to fight for my faith. I'll be dead in my grave. I'll let you take me back in Egypt. They went to Moses and said, you told Jehovah to beat me. 
I had to get color purple for old time's sake. All right, let me finish up. Let me finish up. Let me finish up. He said, but by the way, they did eat and they died. I'm offering you a bread that will make you live. He was really forward, fast forwarding to his death. He really was fast forwarding to the fact that one day he would die for them. And eating his flesh and his blood is really talking about, I believe, communion. I think it was really, and that, I don't mean just the service of communion, but the idea that you do something to God with your brothers and sisters that reminds you to go to the world to tell the message of God. It's something you do for God with each other so that you're reminded of your mission to go to the world, but they didn't want anything of that. They said, what? Eat your, eat, eat what? Drink your, okay, first of all, he didn't want the crown. Glad we didn't crown this fool. First, we just thought he was mean and impudent. Now we know he's crazy. So I'm talking about he came from above. We, wait, ain't this Joseph's son? And I love this because you think, oh, they know his lineage. No, 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 they mad. They knew Joseph wasn't his daddy. Oh, you coming from heaven? <laughs> Isn't this Joseph's son? Don't look nothing like Joseph. Isn't this Joseph's son? We know his people. You know they still arguing about his paternity. You know how folks say, you know how little towns are. That ain't none of his daddy. He don't look nothing like his brothers and sisters. They got Joanna, Joanna, Josita, Josepha, and Jesus. Mm. You know how people are? Mm. He don't look like none of his sisters. Jesus is saying, unless you understand the sacrifice that I've made for you, unless you understand that I've come in to die for you, unless you understand, unless you understand that I came to give my body to this world and my blood to this world so that you could come to my table and have communion with the Father. What, you want bread? You trying to sell out for biscuits? You trying to sell out for sardines? And I am God in your midst and I'm not enough? Unless we make Jesus enough, he won't be enough. You understand what I'm saying? Unless we make him enough for us, he won't become that. They said, this is a hard saying. In the original language, it means rough. Not hard to understand, hard to do. Isn't it interesting? We talk about, I don't want to read the Bible because it's so hard to understand. You know what our problem is in Scripture? It's not wrestling with the things that we don't understand. It's disobedience to the stuff we do. Oh, come on. No, people aren't walking around saying, Oh, if I just understood, I'd do it. No, 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 no. You don't come to my office because I just don't get it. We come and say, I don't want it. I don't want it. We're not really struggling with what we don't understand. We're struggling with what we do. And do we want to do that? Jesus was calling the people to a covenant. My blood, my body. He's calling to a covenant. They said, this is a hard saying. And they turned their backs. He then looked to the 12 and said, are you going to leave me too? And they said, Peter said, no. We have no place else to go. That's true worship. When you got, or when you got options, you are not worshiping yet. Young ladies, if he's got options, he ain't ready for you yet. You are plan A, period. When they got other options, they're not ready for you because you were just an option. You would always be just an option. And when plan B, C, D, and E fall through, you'll be a very good option, a very warm option. But you'll be only an option. When you get to the place, what if you had a conversation with Jesus every day? What if at the foot of your bed every day Jesus stood when you woke up and said, are you going to turn to? And you throw off the covers and say, for what? Where am I going to go? Who does me like you do? Who puts me to bed and tucks me in in peace and wakes me up in patience? Who lays me down stressed and wakes me up refreshed? Who lays me down illegitimate and wakes me up legitimate? Who lets me go to bed confused and I wake up insightful? Where else am I going to go? Who tucks me in poor and wakes me up rich? 
Who puts me to bed broke down and wake up? A daughter of God, a son of God. Where else am I going to go? You want to make the devil mad and scared? Don't just wear a WWJD around your wrist. Don't get up out of that bed until you just say to the devil like Jesus asked you, where else am I going to go? You have the keys of life. You picked me up and changed me. For generations, you've been chasing me. You've been waiting for me to come down through my mother's womb and my father's loin. And you've been waiting to bring me to this world of sweet communion and relationship with me. I'm not going to turn my back. I'm not going to turn my heart. I'm not going to turn my face. I'm not going to lay down my jaw. Where else? 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 Where else can I go? Sometimes he can't even ask you because sometimes we already there before he can even ask us. He comes early in the morning, we already up and out. We tweeting and we're texting and we're posting and we're talking and we're lying and we're avataring. We're making ourselves bigger than life and we're doing work. So we he can't, so he can't even ask us, are you going to leave me? Because we already have. I'm asking you to come back, come back, come back to the place, come back to the place. Peter said we ain't going anywhere, but today we have gone somewhere. We've gone trying to work it out ourselves. We've gone trying to figure it out ourselves. We're going trying to strengthen it ourselves. But come back to the foot of the throne. Come back to the seat of humility. Come back to where Jesus is and allow Jesus to ask you, are you going to leave me too? And then stand up before me and say, no, 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 no. You're the only help I know. You're the only way I know. You're the only father I got. You're the only mother I got. You're the only family I got. I wouldn't have sobriety without you. I wouldn't have peace without you. I wouldn't have life without you. I wouldn't have hope without you. I wouldn't have tomorrow without you. I wouldn't have my child without you. I wouldn't have my daughter without you. I wouldn't have sanity without you. I wouldn't have power without you. I wouldn't have sight without you. I wouldn't have joy. 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 Are you going to leave him too? Are you going to leave him too? Because if you haven't told him no, you might be telling him yes. If you have not told him no, you might be telling him yes. Are you going to leave him too? Are you going to leave him too? Are you going to leave me 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 too? Peter said no. Peter said no. He says 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 no. I don't have any place else to go. How many of you are out of options? How many of you are out of options? Listen, I don't mean because you're destitute. I mean because you're desperate. I know you got food on the table, but how many of you are out of options? I know you got a good credit card in your wallet, but how many of you are out of options? I know you got a good car, but how many of you are out of options? I'm tired of options. I'm tired of options because they don't last. I'm tired of options because they tell you that you're bigger than you are. Then they tell you when they don't work that you are worse than you are. And options just lie. Options just distract. Options just get me away from Christ. But I want Jesus. 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 I don't want church. I want Jesus. I don't want mere tradition. I want Jesus. I don't want a building. I want Jesus. I don't want central air. I want Jesus. I don't want a grant. I want Jesus. I don't want notoriety. I want Jesus. I don't want fame. I want Jesus. I don't want bumping circles. I want Jesus. 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 I want him in the morning. I want him at noon. I want him when the sun goes down. I want him when it's hard. I want him when it's cold. I want him when it's dark. I want him when it's hard. I want him. I want him. I want him. Why? Because he wanted me when nobody else did. He wanted me when nobody else did. He wanted me. I want him. I want him. I want him. I desire him. I hunger and thirst after him. I strive after him. I want him. I want Jesus. I want him. I want him in famine. I want him in abundance. I want him in the summer. I want him in the winter. I want him when nobody else is there. I want him when everybody is there. I want him when it's dark. I want him when it's bright. I want Jesus. Why? Because before the beginning of the world, he chose me. Because before he placed me in my mother's womb, he chose me. Before the doctor slapped me and brought me into this world, he knew me. Before I was conceived, he knew me. Before 
before I came to this world. He called me son. He called me leader. He called me strong. He called me worthy. He called me hopeful. He called me tall. He called me bountiful. He called me abundant. He called me abundant. He called me abundant. He called me abundant. Yes, I want him. Where else am I going to go? Have you lost your mind, Jesus? Have you lost your mind, Jesus? Have you lost your mind, Jesus? There's no other place. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Nowhere else.